But so I think the, the, the main question here is how do younger kids deal with discrimination? Younger Muslim children deal with discrimination in schools. I mean, I see if I can have a, a thought. I'm not sure I really, really grasp the question, but let me see what I can answer from what I understand. So I think, you know, of course, it is a responsibility of, if we're talking about younger children in school, it is a responsibility of administration to make sure that our children are not discriminated, right? Um, I think if you are in, um, you know, I don't know, secondary school or primary school, I think the administration should be, should take responsibility for protecting our children, making sure. Um, and I know that there have been cases of, I think, you know, maybe school students who are not allowed to take their YAC exam or something like that because they wore the hijab. I think that's very wrong. I think people should stand up for that. Uh, the hijab literally, in the end, it's the piece of cloth on your head does not, you know, does not stop you from being able to engage society. So I think all of that is not right. And that is a job of administration and government to ensure. I think if you have children who are in public institutions who may not where the institutions may not necessarily be uh, religious or Islamic in nature. I think you need to have conversations. Um, exactly, somebody's saying that right now. I think you need to have conversations with your children, build their confidence, let them understand who they are, their identity. If there's a teacher who wants to discriminate or whatever, make sure that they stand up um, against that. I, I, I think I have one little tiny story. When I was in boarding school, my house mistress, and, and maybe I should be very careful about the intimate details of this, but I think she had little issues with me and when I would pray and all of that. And, you know, one day I think she's like, Bada, I'm calling you. And I was praying and I was like, obviously I didn't answer her. And I think she was upset, but it's like, I'm praying. I don't, I can't answer you when I'm praying or she asked him to go call me and I would be praying, you know, and I think she had an issue with that. But Alhamdulillah, I think even at that young age, I was confident enough to say, excuse me, Ma, I don't know what to tell you, but I was praying. I cannot get off from my prayer to answer you, whether you're in front of me or you've asked a student to come and call me. So I think we'd have to have this kind of conversations with our children, you know, to know their rights, to understand their religion and stand up. And if there's any discrimination, just tell your parents and tell the administration. And I think for people who are in power, people who make policies, make sure that our institutions, our secondary schools, our primary schools, that they're able to accommodate, you know, different kinds of students, they're able to have their identities. Um, we have the morning prayer in school, in, in some schools, the Christian morning prayer, why can't we allow our Muslim students in those schools as well to also, you know, wear the hijab if their parents choose to, to have them wear it at that very young age? There's nothing wrong in that. And I think we should protect our children in those institutions. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, um, Nora, do you want to add anything? Yes, yes, please. Um, so this is a very sad reality, I believe, in Nigeria. Um, maybe this is the Nigerian perspective that one of the speakers spoke about, right? Where indeed, um, there's not much of, um, there's not much of an opportunity for us to, for some people, right, to get the, the platform to really shine um, um, through the hijab. Right. Um, so, so what that means, or what I mean by that, is to say that um, you're trying to suppress, you know, the coming population from even deciding that they want to don the hijab because they're looking at their seniors and they're, just, they're saying, oh, you know, this guy that you know they made him kneel, kneel outside, you know, the white classroom for three hours, you know, because or oh, this lady that, you know, face that, I'm not going to do it, you know, and, you know, I live in a family that doesn't mind if I do wear the hijab or not. Um, but the truth is, at this juncture, I think there is a lot of, uh, and we know that administration in Nigeria is a very poor <laughs> thing, you know, all the way from, you know, the government, you know, up or, you know, down to, you know, the schools and, you know, whoever is supposed to be responsible for you. But I just want to say here that there are avenues, right? And that's what we need to keep um, mindful of, right? That every time that you face some sort of discrimination, speak to Micah, you know, like, let's do it directly now. Speak to Micah. There's lots of organizations that are together fighting um, uh, this discrimination that a lot of people face in Nigeria. So there's a lot of um, stuff that is going on in the background that they might not come out to say for whatever reason, but don't shy away from going to tell somebody your experience and saying, this is what I'm suffering. Um, do you think I can get help somewhere? So seek help. Your, administ your school administration might not give it to you, but speak to somebody else. I had some sort of discriminatory issue um, in at work, right? Whereby um, I, I, I worked for a multinational. I didn't expect to experience that. Um, and um, so basically they used to have a morning prayer in the office. Um, and it used to happen in my own office. 
uh, such that I had to exit every time you know the, that prayer was to start. Um, and the manager saw that that could easily be something that I would you know speak up against or something that would would uh, happen. Um, you know, it, it would be a, a clear breach, right, on her part. The fact that I had they had to basically displace me every time I went. Um, I was very new in the organization at the time, and I spoke with um, members of the Islamic Society, and. You know, everybody had a different way to tackle the issue, but I got a lot of help that way. And subhanAllah, I started off working in Port Harcourt. It, I don't know if anybody <laughs> or this girl has ever worked or been in Port Harcourt, but there are parts of Nigeria that are even less. If you think the Yoruba people are bad enough you know, for calling somebody Mola or calling somebody else a Leha, you know, go to other parts of the country where they, I, I saw people that said to me, I've never met a Muslim. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I can't help you. <laughs> Wow. I'm not going to take you to where, yes, you know, that's how bad it is in some parts of the country. And that's where I was, right? Um, and subhanAllah, that problem that I had with this manager that started off as them discriminating against me, ended up as me being moved back to Lagos, right? Which is where I initially wanted to be, right? So Allah sometimes, you know, so sometimes these things start off as, you know, it's small, some discrimination. Don't sleep on it. You know, please say something to somebody about it, right? Be careful, be strategic in the way that you try and, you know, um, and solve that situation. But one of my, my personal ethos in life, I don't keep quiet, right? I don't go shouting around like a mad woman, but if I have a problem, I definitely seek solutions, right? And I would just say it sometimes casually to people, but look for help. And subhanAllah, in looking for that help, you might be getting, you know, the greatest spotlight you ever got on your life, right? It might start from discrimination and you find that, you know, somebody is sponsoring you as a student somewhere. Um, and, you know, all of these opportunities being opened up for you just because you were the one that chose to speak up. So if you want to do it anonymously, please use um, that route. Um, if you also want to do it um, in a way where you, know, you present yourself forward, don't ever be shy of that because, you know, th this is one of those things where in the hadith where the Prophet Muhammad uh, Wasallam said that there will come a time when holding on to you, your religion will be like holding on to hot coal. You know, so indeed, you know, it's more difficult for some. Um, the timing sometimes is also, it doesn't work for some, but hold on to it because wallah, wallah, it pays off. It really does always, always, it will always pay off. So speak up about it, speak to even people that you think, ah, they will never have the answer. Speak up about it. You know, you'll be surprised it will lead somewhere, right? So it, it, I, I won't belittle it. It's a big thing. It happens to people. It's real. Um, we've overshot our time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think, oh, I'm just going to add something. There's a comment here in the comment section where someone says, I think parents need to focus on the confidence building in the children. That helps them stand up for themselves when, when you're not there, which is very important. For example, what um, Ajara was saying that she, um, so a teacher was calling and she was praying and that's because she's confident in herself and in her religion that she can tell that teacher, even at a very young age that I don't know what to tell you, I was praying. Most children can't do that because once you are much, especially in Nigeria, when you are talking to someone that is much older and they're someone of authority, you feel the need to, you know, well, you know, to kind of make yourself smaller because they're older and they're they are in a position of authority. But having that confidence and being confident in her religion was why she was able to say that at the time. And yeah, just wanted to add that because that was a that was an important comment I noticed. So thank you, um, Ellie, for that. <laughs>